put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 371st edition of Energy Week. We are recording this on um, the 14th of May, 2020. I am George Harvey, and with me is the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. Flesh. (laughs) It always comes out that way, doesn't it, Tom? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Every day I go to the to the internet and I, I put together a web, web posting for my blog, which is geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. And I put together 10 to 15 news items, usually 15. And then from those, Tom and I get um, about three a day that we roll into a TV show of 21 items. And you can visit uh, various places, my my blog, geoharvey.com, or a couple of places that you should be able to find links to or uh, whatever. <clears throat> so you can get to them from BCTV or from your TV or from YouTube. <clears throat> and you can go and follow this um, broadcast in that way. So you have something to say, I'll bet you, Tom. Well, I, I obviously read all of these things beforehand, and some of them are very interesting and informative. And uh, I would almost recommend that our viewers read every one of these, but uh, that's kind of impossible, I think. Well, we've got a, we've got a pretty good set of uh, material this week. Uh, some of it's really... These are, th- this was particularly good. There were some very good articles. A lot of them were very long. Yeah, and some of them um, are very important. Oh, yeah. I mean, the first article that we've got is, I would say, important. That's well, let's find out about that. Okay. You want to read a title, Tom? Abu Dhabi, to have cheapest solar power ever at 1.35 cents per kilowatt hour. That's incredible. <laughs> this is really... Yeah, it's incredible. Abu Dhabi is to have the cheapest electricity ever from a solar farm, reports say. As the capital of the UAE, Abu Dhabi is no stranger to solar price records, and the new uh, low PV bid chosen by Abu Dhabi's public electric electric utility will bring down the uh, cost of solar to 1.3 cents per kilowatt hour. And you know, Tom, just last week, um, in Dubai, the record was set at 1.7, or a tiny bit less than 1.7. So this is a significant reduction. It is that. Uh, I want to just mention a little bit about UAE, United Arab Emirates. That's, that's a, a small country. It's really a, a, a bunch of collection of very small countries yes. uh, that remained independent of the Saud family in Saudi Arabia. They were under uh, protection, basically, of the British in the early part of the 20th century. Yeah. And they formed their own country now. So there's about there's about five or six of them, actually. Abu Dhabi is one of them. And uh, what was the other one you just mentioned? Dubai. Dubai is another one. And... Uh, they're a lot more progressive than Saudi Arabia is. Yes, they are that. <laughs> they have things like movies and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of more similar, I think, to Kuwait. Um, but they certainly have this incredible move to solar power, and it's it's kind of... Well, they've got a, a lot of sun, <laughs> and they've got a lot of desert. That's true. And they... But, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, let's move on here, because okay. uh, I was just going to say it, exactly that. This comes from the article. The UAE has abundant sunshine and flat, empty stretches of desert, as well yeah. as an abundance of oil and gas, yeah. plus the world's largest solar PV farm, which we are looking at above. Yes. 
and the cheapest solar farm ever built. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't even read the title, did I? No, I you read probably the cheapest solar power ever at one. Yeah, I did say that, at 1.35 yeah. cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. We should probably move on to the next article. Well, there's one more sentence here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. But Dabby has supported growing the growing solar power market as a whole and helps to ensure low-cost financing. We need cooperation. This is an important sentence. We need cooperation from our governments worldwide if we are going to fully embrace the transition to renewable and sustainable energy. Right. You know, it's going on. It's it happening. Is. No but there are forces that are trying to oppose it for monetary reasons. Yeah. Okay, we've got that that one was from Clean Technica and our next one is also from Clean Technica and for inexplicable reasons has a picture uh, a map of the world with uh, April heat, which is air heat, not ocean heat. Well, there's some pretty hot spots on there though. There are, yeah. Well, this this says April well the map Okay. <laughs> I was reading the title of the map, and they can see it up on the, on the screen, I imagine. Yeah. Oceans are record warm, which likely means stronger hurricanes and larger wildfires. Highly destructive fires in places like California and Australia may be hard to remember adequately now that we've been, they have been eclipsed somewhat by the coronavirus pandemic. But the oceans are warm. Large storms and wildfires are on the way. Read that again. Oceans are warm. Large storms and wildfires are on the way. The, the thing about the warm oceans is that if the oceans are warm, they heat the air above them, and the air that's above them wants to rise and because it's warm. And if the oceans are warm, they also um, have a lot of evaporation of, of water uh, into that air as that goes into the air. Yep, and that water is going to go up, and it's going to get cold when it gets up there, and it's going to want to drop out as rain and come back to the earth. And that what goes up must come down, I suppose. <laughs> but it 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 really fuels the the big storms that we've got when the when the Gulf of Mexico, for example, or the equatorial. Um, uh, Atlantic Ocean and so forth are warm. It just, Indian Ocean and those affecting yeah. Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And depending upon where you are, this might mean extra water in the air or that the air is extra dry. It might mean that the air is um, moving fast or it might mean that things just don't move very much. And what we're seeing a lot of these days is that, like Hurricane Harvey, the the hurricane formed, and then it moved to Texas, and then it just sat there. Sat there, got wet over Houston. Yeah, and the same thing was true of Katrina. It it stayed where it was for a for a fair amount of time, dumping water on the landscape. And this is something which is really difficult. So, well, I'll read a little bit for the article here. Very two sentences. The change in climate we are experiencing is human caused, rather than a part of a natural cycle, according to NOAA. If the Gulf of Mexico remains warm, another major hurricane could plow through the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's move on here. we got okay. some nice picture of a bunch of wind turbines. And yeah. What's happening there in that picture? What What is that? What's happening there in that picture? Oh well, you know this is this is uh, chemtrails. They're dumping uh, atmospheric dust in, you know. Oh, is that what's happening? <laughs> Hardly. No, these are these are trails of condensation behind the wind turbines because the wind turbines have introduced turbulence uh, turbulence into the air, and the air here is very humid, so the particles of water in the air bump into each other and condense. And this is very much like the, the the contrails behind aircraft, except that the contrails are very largely made up of um, of water vapor water. that comes from the engines. Here, it's just just the turbulence. So the the turbulence is just causing the water that's already there to yes. kind of condense. Yes, and you know, I saw a picture of the of the Rock of Gibraltar recently 
where the wind going across the Rock of Gibraltar had caused a um, cloud to form behind it. And the cloud just sat there with the passing of time. Interesting. It, it's like a standing wave in a stream where you have, you know, a rock in a stream and there's a wave above it. Yeah, yep. It always stays there, and this was the Rock of Gibraltar. Uh, the the whole thing of chemtrails is something that I'm, you know, I know a little bit about about the aerosols that they put in because I've actually made them, and um, people don't really understand it, but it's a, it's made into conspiracy theory, and I, I, I just can't buy it. Anyway, we've got an item here from Green, I'm sorry, from Clean Energy Wire. Coronavirus impact lays bare inflexibility of German power generation and demand. And the relationship of this, by the way, to the picture is that the, the German power generation is getting to be more and more dependent on offshore wind power, which is what we're seeing there. Slumping power demand from a pandemic and April's strong wind and solar power production have revealed that Germany's fossil and renewable energy generation as well as electricity demand need to be much more flexible, according to experts. Well, this is a long and informative article. Yeah. And what it starts off by saying is that sunny and windy weather has led to strong renewable power production. Right. But low demand in neighboring countries has meant that Germany could not export the excess electricity, resulting in negative power prices, which we've talked about on the show. You yeah, many times. Paying, they're paying customers to use the power rather than turning off the plants. It's less costly. Yeah. Recurring negative prices can result in system instability. Well, I would figure that. <laughs> yes. There is one thing that I'd like to say about this business of being flexible, though, and that is, and the, the article says this, not not in so many words, but the most inflexible uh, sources of power that we've got are um, big uh, baseload fossil fuel plants and nuclear plants. So what they're saying is, actually, if you want to read a little bit between the lines, in order to get the flexibility that they need, what we have to do is extend the renewable power not um, going, you know, returning to the baseload power. Well, we're, technology is on our side. Yeah. Uh, as, as we've talked about on the show, the prices of renewables have been plummeting. Yes, as we're going to see more of um, in, in seconds, <laughs> literally. <laughs> well, we got a nice picture coming up of a gas plant. A weird gas plant. A weird gas plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's called coffee table size units to power new gas plant. Yeah. This is uh, Friday, May 8th, we've got to. And this is from ABC News. That is Australian ABC, not not American ABC. And do you have a – did you read the title to this, Tom? Coffee table size units to power new gas plant. Oh, I was expecting you to say near Roma. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Well, Rome was just a town. I didn't figure anybody knew, even knew where it was. Yeah, you know, when I when I saw the title, I thought they were talking about Italy. The the Australian <laughs> Renewable South, Energy Southwest Queensland. Yeah, okay. The Australian Renewable Energy Agency is providing a million dollars. That's a million dollars Australian, which is about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the United States, in funding to give Australia's uh, to give authorities a chance to assess the benefits of using a hydrolyzer, I'm sorry, an electrolyzer powered by solar panels to extract hydrogen from the atmosphere, and then the hydrogen is used to make renewable methane. Well, electrolyzer is like high school chemistry. Yeah, it is. Almost Look. anybody has, has done some electrolysis of water, turning it into hydrogen and oxygen, but that, they're doing that same thing here on an industrial scale. Yeah, and they're also... Um, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, so this is this is direct carbon capture, and uh, um, using the electricity from the solar panels to force that to react against the hydrogen to create methane, which is then used um, as natural gas. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's by the way for anybody who really wants to know. 
the, the natural gas thing, they make hydrogen, and then they take four hydrogen molecules and combine them with one carbon dioxide molecule to make one methane molecule and two water molecules. And then the water is sent back to the electrolyzer to be reused. It's an interesting, interesting process. Yeah, it is. Well, the project involves the installation of hundreds of thousands of small modules. Yeah. And they, the total can create up to 74 gigajoules of renewable methane. Now, a gigajoule is a million BTU, or 300 kilowatt hours. So a gigajoule is nothing to sneeze at. A gigajoule is nothing to sneeze at, but here, you know, you always say giga is bigger. Yeah. And a joule is pretty small. <laughs> It's like it's like a, a million grains of sand. Uh, how big is that going to be? It's hard to imagine, you know? Yeah, a joule is a small article, and a gigajoule is a, a million BTU. Yeah. It's a uh, trillion joules. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, we should. We got a nice picture of a... Looks we like a school, but it's the Great River Energy Headquarters, huh? Which has a wind turbine right behind it. Yeah, that's that's really for propo- for promotion, I think. Do you? Well, well, if you if you drive up by uh, uh, Boston and you look off to the distance where where the electric company is, they have a turbine in their yard. Yes, and in fact, I used to live south of Boston, and I drive drive by that. Been there a long time. Been there a long time. Yeah, this this item is from Green Tech Media, and I have to say it's one of the most important items of the week. Well, it says long duration breakthrough. Form Energy, which is a company, their first project, uh, Form Energy's first project, tries pushing storage to 150 hours. Now that blew my mind. Well, the you know as I got into hey. it farther, what? Huh? As I got into it farther, it blew my mind more and more. That's six days. I know. A week. Form Energy made a deal with it uh, for its new energy storage technology with Minnesota utility Great River Energy. The battery is competitive on price relative to the power output, which is kilowatts or megawatts, but it, it provides an enormous amount of electricity, which is the kilowatt hours or megawatt hours at that price. And what this means is, if you want to install a megawatt of battery so that you can get a megawatt out of it, it costs roughly the same as it does with lithium-ion batteries. But where those lithium-ion batteries might keep going for four or five or six hours... I was just going to say, it's a matter of hours. Yeah, at peak demand. Well, we've talked a lot about the Hornsdale Power Reserve, and that is 100 megawatts. 135 megawatt hours, which means if it were running at peak output, it would it would it would run out in about an hour and 20 minutes. Well, this this guy's talking six days, so it's yeah. a big improve, a huge improvement. Yeah. This is 150 hours. This thing can go, and since the price is close to what it is for lithium ion, if you wanted to replace the Hornsdale Power Reserve, you could do it at a at a close price, except you'd be getting 25 times as much of electricity out of it. Well, this is, this is another one of those interesting articles this week. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, I, I could see the, the cost of electricity coming from batteries going to well below a cent per kilowatt hour with this. Which, well, this is the coming thing. Yeah. Now, one thing I want to point out to everybody is they didn't tell us how this works. And the only reason I'm assuming that it does work, because if somebody came to me and said, I've got this battery that will do this, I would have said, this is a scam. Except that in this particular case, the engineers at a utility have looked at it hard enough to agree to buy one. Well, they said, show me, and somebody showed him, and it seems to work. I guess. But this is a huge breakthrough. It is, very big. You got more on that, Tom? Well, as I just said, great progress. Four hours to 150 hours of storage. Yeah. And long-duration storage will be necessary to maintain grid reliability in the future. So this kind of thing is coming. It is. Yep. 
So our next item is uh, has a picture of a deflator mouse. <laughs> you know, that brought back sort of memories, because a long, long time ago, I heard about the Strauss opera called Deflator Mouse. Yeah. You know, when I was only a kid, I said, Flater Mouse, that sounds like Flying Mouse. Which and that's is. a <laughs> way of, of looking at a bat. It's a bat, that's right. And that little guy on the in the picture is a bat, and you can see just off the uh, front of his wings, you can see a little thing sticking out. That's the bat's thumb. The wings are a membrane that runs between the... Right, they're his hands, yep. Yeah, that's right. They're his hands, and they have big, big... Mem- uh, he has tiny, tiny, tiny uh, finger bones, and the membranes stretch among between them, and that's what his, what his wings are. Anyway... Um, we have this item, which is from TPM. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. I don't know. Got a title? How climate change is contributing to skyrocketing rates of infectious disease. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Scientists who study how diseases emerge from the changing environment knew that a pandemic was coming. Climate change is making outbreaks of disease more common and more dangerous, and the number of infectious, uh, emerging infectious disease diseases has been rising fast. This is another good and long article. Yes. Yes. And well, what it, from the article, it's a couple of couple sentences here. Catastrophic loss in biodiversity, reckless destruction of wildland, and warming temperatures have allowed disease to explode. Yes. Ignoring the connection between climate change and pandemics would be, and this is a quote from the article, dangerous delusion. Yes. We turn a blind eye to the fact that our behavior is driving this. We get cheap goods through Walmart, and then we pay for it forever through the rise in pandemics. It's <laughs> upside down. Yes. And this is not just this is not just credit cards t- making things a long uh, pay for, making you pay for a long time. It's it's like you change the environment, you're changing the environment. I had a I had a friend once who made fun of her great aunt who would who would say it's a poor bird that dirties its own nest. And she made fun of it because she thought that was a silly thing to say. But the fact of the well, matter, well, it's a, it's accurate. It might be silly, <laughs> yes. but it's a truism. It's a truism. That's right. Well, we're up to May ninth, which is a Saturday. Nice picture of a Tesla Model 3. Yeah, you know what? I I tend to try to ignore pictures of cars because I get bored by them. Well, they all look alike these days. They all look alike. <laughs> but, you know, when I was a kid, they all looked alike, too, except for the odd person out there who would be driving a Model A Ford. <laughs> I always envied the person with the Model A Ford. I always wanted to own a Model A Ford um, Roadster or, or um, uh, you know, what? That I, was a neat little car. They were neat with a with, with a, a rumble seat. With a rumble seat, I always wanted to have a car with a rumble seat. Um, okay, this one is from Clean Technica. The Tesla Model Three is the best-selling luxury car in the USA by far. Yeah, that's for the first quarter of 2000. The Tesla Model Three accounted for approximately 21 percent of the new small and mid-sized luxury car sales in the United States in the first quarter of 2020. This should not be a a big surprise. It has better acceleration, lower operational cost, and higher resale value. And I was amazed when I looked at the resale value of these because... It's holding up, isn't it? Oh, you know, when I was a kid, the the saying was, you buy a car, it's going to lose half half of its value on the trip home. Yeah. Uh, that, that was very close to being the truth. Yeah, and these things have a resale value that's like 95% after they're a year old. And it is also, by the way, rated as the safest car you can buy. That's very interesting. Isn't it? Well, there's a good article here. There's a lot of graphs on it if you like graphs. Yeah. <laughs> I The graphs that are with this article were not the kinds of graphs that I like particularly, but I suppose a lot of people would get stuff out of them. Well, a Model 3 was the eighth best-selling car in the USA, yes. right behind seven mass-market cars with a much lower base price. Yes. 
And this is an interesting sentence. Model 3 owners were happier with their cars than the owners of any other vehicle model, according to Consumer Reports. That is really impressive. You know, if you think about it, that's really impressive. Yeah. Well, the article gives a list of 70 reasons why Model 3 owners love their cars. <laughs> and one of them that I love was a fart generator. A what? Fart generator. Okay. It makes noises like uh, obscene noises that the body makes. Like a whoopee cushion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that just cracked me up. Okay. Okay. But if you get a new Cecil, you got one of those so you can impress your friends. Yes. yes. Well, there's a picture of a solar farm here coming up. Yep. And this is uh, an item that came from P PV Magazine India. And it's another one. This one blew my mind. So what do you got for a title? Renew Power wins a 400-megawatt round-the-clock renewable auction at uh, uh, 2.90 rupees per kilowatt hour. Right. I'm sorry. I always put in a rupee symbol instead of spelling the word out. And a lot of that is because I want these, these synopses to be to, to fit into a certain amount of space. And well, this I, came from... From the article. Oh, it sure did. But I, I would have, sometimes I will expand things to make them easier to read, and I'm apologizing yeah. to you, Tom. Yeah, I'm looking at that symbol. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, you figured it out. The Solar Energy uh, Corporation of India has concluded a 400 megawatt round the clock renewable power supply auction. Out of nearly 950 megawatts bid, the renewable, uh, Renew Power run the entire capacity of 400 megawatts by quoting the lowest first-year tariff, which was 2.90 rupees per kilowatt hour, which is 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. And the We've seen lower than that. Huh? We've seen lower than that. We've seen lower, but not for 24-7. This is 24-7 power. This is yeah, power. This is, that, that's true. This is power that, you know, people have always said, well, renewable power, you know, it doesn't work. It's, it's, um, it's not going to be there when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And this thing, th this addresses that really big time because it says, okay, I don't care where you get this renewable energy from, but it's got to be renewable and it's got to be round the clock, 24, 24 hours. And hey, they got a 25-year power supply contract out of this. So. Absolutely. And and the 20. One of the things that I keep think about thinking about when I think about this is if you compare this to a nuclear plant, this 400 megawatts is approximately two thirds of the Vermont Yankee plant. But yeah. the Vermont Yankee plant had to shut down every 18 months for a month so that it could be refueled. This thing is not going to shut down. This is more reliable. It's renewables. Renewables, that's right. And this just says you're worried about the wind not blowing and the sun not shining. Well, by the way, we happen to have very cheap batteries these days. That's that's blowing my mind. That's coming. That's coming. It's Well, it's here. I mean, 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. If you look at the last Lazard... Um, LCOE charts, l levelized cost of electricity. The cheapest fossil fuel source on the charts is is combined cycle natural gas, and that is 4.4 .4 cents to 6.6 .6 cents. This is 3.8 cents. This will beat any natural gas. And you know, basically, what it comes down to is we're we're moving into a time where you'd have to be crazy to build a, a natural gas power plant. Well, I think that uh, burning things to make electricity is going to become a thing of the past very soon. Very soon, except for one thing, which is, which is hydrogen. And um, we'll see how that works. Okay, should we go well, on? The, the, the thing about hydrogen is, is the uh, byproduct is a very horrible thing. It's water. <laughs> yes, indeed. It is water. I have to admit that, Tom. <laughs> well, this is another interesting article. Yeah, it's, it's, the heat and humidity combination not experienced before is becoming more common. 
this kind of reprices what we've already spoken of today. Right, and we have a picture here of a child in a heat wave. Looks like he's having fun. It does, and it's this particular article is from CNN. A report from the Earth Institute at Columbia University indicates that the combination of extreme heat and humidity, once believed never experienced by humans, is already happening. Such weather surpasses the theoretical threshold of human survivability. That's a scary sentence. Well, it is. And one of the things, you know, there's been a lot of stuff coming out of the news uh, saying if we don't address this, it's going to be somewhere between one and three and a half billion people are going to have to move. And, okay, here we are in Brattleboro, Vermont. How many of them are we able and willing to accept into our society because we've been burning fossil fuels. Yeah, you got a point there. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me let me take a couple of quick takeaways from the article. Good. Okay. The devastating effects of killer, quote, human heat waves, human heat, humid heat waves are already ravaging the world. Yes. Climate change is increasing both air temperatures and the amount of moisture in the air making humid heat events more frequent and severe. And, you know, that is something that I find frightening for a reason that it has, doesn't have much to do with how hot people get on the ground. That's going to cause unbelievable torrential rains. Well, that's what's hap- happened in Australia. Yeah. You have more on that? Well, I was just thinking, there, it's kind of ironic. They're getting more rain, but they're also getting more fires. Yes. Well, yeah. Let's move along. Okay, we're up to Sunday, May 10th, and we have an item here from SF Bay Area Indie Media, SF being San Francisco. I would think, yes. New California oil permits rose 7.8%. In 2020's first quarter, as oil prices plunged, we've talked about that a couple of times already. Yeah, we haven't talked about permits rising, though. No, Um, we haven't. Increase in in permits. The picture here is a picture of Toluca Street, Los Angeles, that was taken around 1900. And it gives you a new sense of the meaning of not in my backyard. Boy, does it. I would hate to have bought that white little house in the picture. (laughs) About uh, t- two years before any of this stuff happened. Oh, man. If Can you, you imagine? <laughs> look you, at those. Yeah. Really rigs everywhere. Yes, and if you look on the left there, you can see that there are steps coming up from the road. And they somebody are, back there. They're going, I don't know, they're going to a house, and somebody built a house, built those steps, you know, had possibly a very nice place. And all of a sudden, these guys moved in. And by the way, Toluca Street, I looked it up to see what it looks like now. Yeah. It does not look like a particularly attractive place to live, but it doesn't. It sure doesn't look anything like this. I'm sure those drilling derricks are gone. Long gone. Nobody there remembers them, I'd bet. Okay. Um, you, the the uh, synopsis here is, because you've already read the title, as the price of oil went below zero, new oil and gas drilling permits actually increased 7.8% in California during the first quarter of 2020. According to a report by two watchdog groups, another thing that increased was spending by an oil lobbying group. That's interesting. Yeah, but you know what? They're not spending money on drilling they're spending money on permits and lobbying, which is a lot cheaper. And my guess is that they just don't have the money to spend on drilling. Right now, they're, I think you're. I think you're right. Yeah. With the price of oil plunging and uh, going negative, and well, uh, this is from the article. What is puzzling is why would oil companies be in a position to drill for oil during the midst of the coronavirus crisis, where there is no economic incentive? And dozens of oil tankers with nowhere to go because the because of oil price cr- collapse idling off the California coast. Well, what they're doing is, you know, these when they get the permit, they don't have to start drilling right away. 
and what they're hoping is that there's going to be an economic recovery and there will be a reason for them to drill. But the cost of a permit is tiny compared to the t cost of of um, actually drilling. Well, it's still lacking the smaller producers off the market. They're going bankrupt. The smaller producers are going bankrupt, no question about it. Should Let's we move on here. We've got a kind of a pretty picture here, or at least it would be pretty without that oil rig in the middle. <laughs> this is an article from... Free Malaysia Today. And I want to say something about that picture, by the way. Um, it's credited here as coming from Eli Hartman and, and, and from Odessa American. The Free Malaysia Today uh, site did not give it credit. And I could not find – I had reason when I, when I put this thing up to think that it really should have been credited. So – this is one of those things, you know, I, I used it, it was with the article, but I made sure that it was credited correctly. Um, anyway, um, I'm sorry, you, you were about to read the title, I think. Oil drilling collapses to 11-year low with explorers in retreat. Yeah, oil and natural gas exploration fell to an all-time low as the COVID-19 pandemic snuffed out the remnants of the U.S. shale boom. Now, this is a, an important sense, sentence, I think. In the span of just eight weeks, 53% of active oil and gas rigs in the country have gone dark, according to data released by Baker Hughes. That means half of them have shut down. And, and the a number that was drilling was already really low when that happened. And a lot of those were... Uh, small speculative companies, and when they shut down those rigs, they're down. I don't think they're ever going to go back to work. I don't think so either. Well, from the article, the, the historic slump prompts widespread job cuts, budget reductions, contract cancellations, and well shuts. Yeah. U.S. oil production is in severe decline, and it could take years to turn around. Yes. And this sentence is an important one. Fracking, the more expensive process of blasting a mix of water, sand, and chemicals into drill wells to finally unleash oil and gas trapped in a shale rock, is also in retreat. Yes. There's big okay. changes out there, guys. whole thing. In fact, there was an article that I saw today, um, and I did not put it into my blog, but it said that uh, Saudi Arabia is in serious trouble. They're having to ta put taxes on things. They're they're having to, um, you know, do a lot of things to save money because they haven't got money, and the reason they haven't got money is because of the low price of oil. So, and Saudi's got some of the cheapest oil in the world to drill. Yes, it's it's it, it's almost you can almost get it with a shovel. <laughs> yes. There is a there is a thing that where you can get oil without even drilling or shoveling, and that's called a, a petroleum spring. And they used to be eh, a good deal more common than they are now. Well, they still happen in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the, the Saudi Arabian oil, the Saudi Arabian word for oil, is zift, z-i-f-t, and it has become part of the vernacular. Uh, we use uh, similar words. Uh, to describe things that we don't like. Oh. Okay. So we've got... I an can't repeat the word on television. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. I'll just imagine what it is. We have an article um, from a, an organization called Red, Green, and Blue. Renewable Roundup. Solar and wind dominate new energy installations even after the coronavirus. And we've got a graph here of that shows where the new uh, uh, generating capacity additions are expected to, to uh, come during the course of 2020. By the type of, of generation that are used, like generation. their gas. And you can see that there's a huge, huge spike in December, and that's because, and this happens every year, December comes and they've got to get that stuff in that's required to be in in order to get the tax credits, right. or whatever it is that they're doing. But usually December. Well, December is significant because it's tall. But look at the distribution. Yeah. But the thing is, that kind of brownish color, Yeah, that's natural gas. Yeah. 
that's just minor almost the entire year, and it's minor for the year. Um, and that round pie chart shows 44% of uh, new capacity will be from wind, and 32%, if I'm reading that right, from solar. And almost 10% from natural gas. Yeah. So what have you got for a title here, Tom? Renewable Roundup. Solar and wind dominate new energy installations. I read this already, I think, even after the coronavirus. Well, the U.S. Energy Information Administration's latest information on new capacity additions shows that it expects 42 gigawatts to start commercial operation in 2020. Solar and wind will represent almost 32 gigawatts, which is 76% of the new capacity going online. Well, FERC predicts that wind and solar are each on track to provide more new generating capacity than natural gas over the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah. This is something, and, you know, the the um, <clears throat> the um, material that has come out from the Energy Information Administration has always downplayed, I would say, solar and wind compared to natural gas. They've always said that they expected more from natural gas than appeared and less than from solar and wind. But now, they I don't know what to make of this in terms of what is actually going to go online. It'll be interesting to revisit this next January or February when the, when the data actually emerges. Well, in the long run, with solar and wind, you don't have to pay for the fuel. That's a help, isn't it? I think. <laughs> okay. We're up to Monday, May 11th, and we have an item from businessgreen.com. Another milestone for Britain. The U.K. grid completes the first coal-free month. That's significant. It is. The picture here is Drax Power Station, which used to be certainly the largest coal-burning uh, station in Britain. I think it was over 6 megawatts. Um, uh, 6 gigawatts, I'm sorry. Looks like a pretty big station. It's a pretty big station. And um, they have converted, out, out of the 6 coal-burning units, they've converted 3 of them to burn natural gas and the other three to burn wood. Um, wood chips. Where do they get wood in Britain? <clears throat> From Georgia. They clear cut Georgia. <laughs> you know, you're not kidding. No, I'm not kidding. They said that it was all going to be forest falls and waste wood. And then they went to clear cut Georgia. Yeah. So, you know, what. You, you can see that down there. You drive by and all of a sudden you go through about miles and miles of tree stumps. Yes. It's and then true. you see a forest again for a while. Yeah. Wow. You read the title, I believe. I think I did. Okay, and the synopsis says, the UK's record-breaking run without coal passed another milestone. National Grid ESO confirmed that the grid had completed a full month without any input from the country's coal-fired power stations. The coal-free run is still going on. And as far as I know, it is still today going on. This started... I think so. Yeah. Well, it's only a week ago, so, yeah, it's still going on. It's probably, probably, I've seen references to it still going on after this article came out. But so so, from the article, low-carbon sources provided 70% of the U.K.'s power. Yeah. Gas contributing 30% of the mix. So, so it's, it's three-quarters almost of the power. Yeah. And the U.K. is committed to phasing out the use of coal power by 2025. <laughs> well, I think they've phased it out already for practical purposes. One of the things that I found interesting about this was <clears throat> they were setting record lows um, for use of coal during the winter when the, when the, uh, um, uh, when the demand for, for coal-fired uh, uh, power was, is normal. It's high. So there you go. Anyway, I suppose we should probably go to our next article. It's from The Guardian. Give it a try, anyhow. Yep. Trump's a... environmental blitzkrieg advances under cover of coronavirus. Yeah, there's a picture here of a gas-fired power plant in California, which was taken, by the way, by a guy named David McNew and came through Getty Images, and I see his name a lot. He seems to be quite successful. Um, even amid a pandemic, the Trump administration is weakening U.S. environmental protections, continuing its rollback as the uh, November election approaches. 
During the coronavirus virus lockdown, U.S. federal agencies are pursuing an appalling series of environmental rollbacks. Well, the article's got a list of rollbacks. It's a long, art, long list. Yeah. It's, it's kind of depressing, actually. The administration is acting to cut public health protections while the American public is distracted by a public health crisis. Yeah. And, and it says here, this is from the article, if a Democrat takes the White House, it will take years to reverse some of these changes. Well, this is... This some... isn't about what we're protecting. This is about who we're protecting. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. No question about it. Should we go on? Yeah, we are. I have an article here from The Guardian and their picture of a... I don't even know what that is. It's a steel-making equipment of some kind, and that is steel glowing. And it's, 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 they're rolling up a long strip of steel. Yeah, I, I guess they are. But that looks like it's pretty thick. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. It's also pretty high. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hot. <laughs> okay, what do you got for a title? Green Steel Industry Could Secure Jobs for Australia's Coal Mining Heartland. Well, this is significant for Australia. Yeah, it is. It's significant for everywhere, actually, because it could be done anywhere. An Australian green steel industry could create tens of thousands of jobs in regions reliant on coal mining, giving them a future as demand for carbon-intensive goods falls. A report uh, by the University of Melbourne's Grattan Institute says. Now, what they're talking about is manufacturing steel without using coal. That's interesting. I'd like to know how they do it. Well, I think, Tom, what they're doing here is the steel requires a certain amount of carbon. And that carbon historically has come from what's called net coal. It's a grade of coal that is used for metallurgical work. Right, exactly. The steel is also using uh, a lot of energy, which comes, uh, and they need heat. And that heat historically has come from burning. Uh, burning coal. And that is, I think, what they're talking about. They need they need the carbon in the steel. And it may be that they have found a way of doing that without using coal. It would be easy enough to do. Well, I was reading into the article and trying to figure out how they were doing it. I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, I've seen this kind of thing, green coal, I mean green steel coming up from time to time. It's something that um, I think is worth keeping an eye on. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, May 12th, and... U.S. coal-fired electricity generation in 2019 falls to a 42-year low. Yep, and this is a coal-burning power plant, which is the photograph. Output from the U.S. coal-fired generating fleet dropped to 966,000 gigawatt hours in 2019. That is the lowest level since 1976. The decline in last year's coal generation level was the high, largest percentage decline in history at 16%, and the second largest in terms of absolute in absolute terms at 240 gigawatt hours. And this, I think, is very significant. Um, I want to point out here: coal has been hit really, really hard by the coronavirus, but this is before the coronavirus. This is for last year. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's, it's economics. Yeah, it's economics. There's no question about it. Economics, you know, um, I think there's a confusion among some people about the difference between economics and Obama. They used to say it was Obama's war on coal, but it was economics. It was economics was doing it. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Well, there's a quick takeaway here. The primary drivers of this was increased output for natural gas-fired plants, which are up 8%, and wind turbines, which are up 10%. Yeah. So wind turbines, I think, are establishing themselves more and more widely. Natural gas being up, that doesn't surprise me. Well, the wind turbines are getting bigger and more sophisticated, so it's, you know, it's progress. Yep. And speaking of wind turbines, we have a picture coming up from Matt Arts of Wind Turbine. Interesting and picture. It is an interesting picture, isn't it? This is um, from Renews. 
Well, Arkansas Greenlight's AEPs, American Electric Power, 810 megawatt wind. <laughs> That's a lot of wind. I would think. Well, to give me, give me a, 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 a comparison, the Yankee was at its maximum, 680 megawatts. Yeah, this is um, this is big, although the capacity factor for wind is significantly lower than it is for nuclear, so the amount that they're going to get out of this will be a little bit lower than they were getting from uh, uh, Vermont Yankee, significantly lower, truth be told. Southwestern Electric Power Company, a subsidiary of American Electric Power, got pr- approval from uh, Arkansas regulators to add 810 megawatts of wind energy from three projects. The projects are to be finished in 2020 and 2021 to supply power to customers in um, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma. And one of the things that this kind of brings back is they're getting permission now for a huge set of projects, three projects that are together are huge, and it's all going to be done in less than two years. Well, it's interesting. This uh, Southwest Power serves more than a half million customers. Yeah. In Vermont, whole all of Vermont has half that. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a fairly significant company. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, I th- I think we've got one more item from Tuesday, May twelfth, and it's from. I the think B- you're right. BBC. Yeah, from BBC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to scroll through this article. Nice picture of some turbines there. Yeah. Well, India's carbon emissions fall for the first time in four decades. Now, we've got another thing about this, too. India's CO2 emissions fell for the first time in four decades, even before India's coronavirus lockdown. Falling electric use and comp- uh, competition from renewables had weakened the demand for fossil fuels, according to analysis by environmental website Carbon Brief. So again, we're seeing India having its having its um, fossil fuels emission falling. Again, it's money. Before the coronavirus started really causing mischief. Yeah, this is true. Well, renewables are getting cheaper, and they're spreading throughout India. India is bringing power to the people like this never happened before. Yeah, that's right. People in India are likely to have electric power who who never had it before. So we're up to Wednesday, May 13th, and we have an item from oilprice.com and a picture of a solar array that looks like it's out in the desert. <coughs> it's a large solar array. There is. I wonder where it is. Well, I don't know. I looked for it to find out where it was. I couldn't find anything. Well, there's hills there, and aren't any hills in the United Arab Emirates. I think that might be India. It, it could also, very well be India. It also could be Australia. And for that matter, it could be Chile. I don't think it could be California. No, it doesn't look like California. Nothing looks <laughs> right. Okay, what do you got for a title? COVID-19 could spark a renewable energy boom. Yeah, this is something that I've been seeing a lot about where some people are saying it's terrible for renewable energy, other people saying it's good for renewable energy. Let me read the synopsis. The world as the world finds itself at a crossroads. He's got a move, okay. Virus pandemic has ravaged the global economy, leading to massive unemployment. The recovery looks like it'll take a long time. At the same time, the pr- climate problem is not going away. We have um, the opportunity to build back better. Well, that's sort of what this next sentence says. In the face of the crisis, governments can kill two birds with one stone. Absolutely. By going big on green stimuli, rescuing the economy, while also making big cuts to greenhouse gas. Yes, absolutely. Now you to seize the opportunity may mean that we leap from the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. Well, one of the things that I'm seeing is there's a lot of people saying we've got an opportunity. There's a few people who are saying we, this is it's not going to work. But one of the things here is um, the to, to to note is that some company countries are going to take that opportunity and others are not. And the ones that take it are going to be the ones that are in the lead going yep. into the future. 
Okay, we've got um, an item here from Renew Economy and a picture of the Muscle Row Wind Farm in Tasmania. That's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? Tasmania unveils action plan to reach 200% renewables. Yeah. They're going big time on this. They are, and one of the things that's interesting about this is that the government of Tasmania, which is doing this, has is controlled by the Liberal Party. Which, which means conservative. In which is conservative. And in the federal government, the Liberal Party is very much against renewables. But in South Australia, which is which is controlled by liberals, and Tasmania, which is controlled by liberals, they want to push those renewables. The Tasmania state government un- unveiled a draft action plan to reach its target of 200% renewables by 2040, saying the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the economy meant there were there had never been a more important time to manage the transition to renewable electricity, uh, renewable energy. Well, there's a lot of numbers there, but look look at that one: 200 percent renewables. Yeah. That means they're generating twice as much electricity as they can use. That's right, and you know what that is going to be used for is putting electricity into a um, submarine cable. That exactly. Will send it to Victoria. That's the idea. Exactly. But if for any reason that cable broke yeah. or, or Victoria decided to make its own renewable electricity, Tasmania still has to convert its heat and cooling to electricity, to convert its transportation to electricity, to convert you know all kinds of things to electricity. Ta- Tasmania could use all of that at some point in the not very distant future if that's what they wanted to do. It looks like what they want to do is use all use what they need and sell the rest. That's what they're planning, yeah. Okay, we have one more item. Well, I just got a quick takeaway here. Tasmania oh, okay. will become the battery of the nation. That's what they've been wanting to, you know, they've been saying that they, they wanted to do that. Well, it looks like they see an opportunity to make money and they're going to try to use it. That's right. They want the the flow of money to be into Tasmania. If they were if they were paying for fuel, it would flow out of Tasmania. Yep. So that's where they are. Okay, our last item is from Utility Dive. And we have a picture of New York City here. I was just gonna say it looks like New York to me. Oh, you can see the 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 Chrysler building there on the on the right. Is that the Chrysler building there? I think it is, yeah. And then that must be the Empire State Building on the left. Left it's the Empire State Building, yes. Which is to my eye a little bit less recognizable than the Chrysler building. But nevertheless, this is from Utility Dive. What have you got for a title? Replace New York City peakers with renewables plus storage? The plant owners say they're working on it. New York City ratepayers put up $4.5 billion, that's billion with a B, in capacity payments in the last decade, that's $450 million a year, to keep 16 fossil gas-fired peaking plants available, analysis by Peak Coalition shows. The plant owners they're, say they're working to re- the work to replace them is underway. This and, is politics, baby. Well, you know, th- what's happened here is these owners have been starting to tear the plants down and replace them with batteries because the electricity is cheaper from batteries than it is from peaking plants. And they know it. So... Well, that's what it says. Peak recommends the plants be replaced by distributed energy resources. Right. And uh, they're going to be tying into big offshore wind farms in the not very distant future. And that's going to give them power sources that they can use to charge those batteries. I was reading into the article. Some of these energy stores that they're talking about is going to be on uh, uh, what are the, <laughs> rafts. It's going to be on water. You know, it's it's funny. They've been doing that kind of thing for years. The barges. That's what I was the word I was looking yeah. for. The old World Trade Center had a had its own um, uh, its own generating plant, which was on a barge. Did they? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, we've kind of come to the end of the show here. There's a last slide which says goodbye, and it says have a simply magnificent week. And I'm not sure how. You can be simply magnificent. But there it is. At least the sun's out today. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Adios.